So of the four lenses, how do we know which one to use? How do we motivate our choice? And how do we go about using it? For instance, if we see that forces change momentum, then we can use the momentum lens and say, oh, that change momentum is equal to force times delta t. If we can see an energy transformation from one kind of energy to another, we know that those energies are going to be equal and we'll use the energy lens. And then we can just set all our initial energies to our final energies. Or if there's work that comes in from outside the system, we would add that extra work. If you can say forces are accelerating an object, you can use a dynamics lens. And then you could start by identifying the forces and saying that acceleration is equal to the force divided by the mass. And lastly, if you can look at some motion, displacement, speed, acceleration, as an explicit function of time, then you can use kinematics. In developing the kinematics lens, we want to illuminate the motion. The best way to start this is often with a velocity time graph that quantitatively describe the evolution of the velocity over time. And then we can correlate this to acceleration and displacement, and we might draw their graphs too. Okay, so how does this pan out in a real situation? Let's say you drop a massive object off a cliff and it accelerates to the ground below. We can examine this event with all four lenses, but depending on what you're looking for, a different lens will be more helpful than the other. The lens I like the best for this is the energy lens. How do we motivate an energy lens? We say, oh, can we identify a transformation of energy? And here, as the rock falls some delta H, we can clearly see we have some gravitational potential energy changing into some kinetic energy as this speeds up. With no other energies put into the system or taken out, we can therefore say that the change in potential energy is turned into kinetic energy. And that would be the final velocity squared. I can use this, for instance, to find the final velocity. The masses cancel, and V final is equal to the square root of 2G delta H. Now this is if I start at rest, V initial equals zero. What if it's not at rest in the beginning? What do I do if, for instance, I throw it downward at 10 meters per second? V initial equals 10 meters per second. How does that change the final answer? What do you do? Right, we can't just add that 10 meters per second on to our final answer. We don't conserve velocity. We conserve energy. This velocity is entered into the energy balance as kinetic energy. So we would turn that 10 meters per second into the initial kinetic energy. And so the final kinetic energy would be equal to this initial kinetic energy plus this extra amount of potential energy that's turned into kinetic energy. Another question, if starting from rest gives us V final, what is V one half? That is, what is the speed halfway down? Is the speed halfway down equal to one half V final? Is it equal to more than one half V final or is it equal to less? than one half V final. How would you do that? Right, we would have to turn this back into an energy problem and say, oh, I've only lost half of the potential energy. How is velocity going to change? Velocity is not proportional to height. It's proportional to the square root of height. So if delta H is one half as big, then V one half will equal V final times the square root of one over two because when you square that, you'll get your one half. And so that's equal to 0.7 V final. And so in fact, 
halfway down, you're going considerably faster than half of the final speed. Why is that? We can look at our kinematics lens to see this. We motivate the kinematics lens by looking at motion as an explicit function of time. How does this rock speed up under the acceleration of gravity? Let's say for three seconds. Under the acceleration of gravity, every second, the speed increases at 10 meters per second in the downward direction. Because acceleration equals change in velocity over change in time. And so change in velocity equals acceleration times delta t. And so in the beginning, the rock is moving very slowly and doesn't go as far. As it speeds up, it goes faster, so it spends more time in the first half of the fall than the second. And so therefore, under the acceleration of gravity, the delta v in the beginning is going to be more than the delta v at the end. Because it accelerates for more time reaching the first half than it does during the second half of the fall because it's going faster. What if someone asks you, what is the force of gravity that's pulling that down? Then you would say, oh, it's this force that's causing acceleration. What is the force that's accelerating this rock? Then we would be able to motivate the dynamics lens by saying, oh, forces are causing acceleration. And I could then draw the rock and say, what are the forces acting on it? Oh, only one. The force of gravity is accelerating it down. And then I can say, oh, it's the force of gravity I'm looking at must be equal to the mass times the acceleration. And in this case, it's the mass of the rock times the acceleration of gravity. To me, the most interesting lens is going to be the momentum lens. Because what if someone asks you, did you violate the conservation of momentum? Or if someone asks you, what happened to the Earth during this time? Because you could certainly say our initial momentum is equal to zero, but the final momentum is not zero. And then you'd say, oh, right, 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 right. Change in momentum is caused by a force, and there's a force of gravity acting on this. But a force is an interaction between two bodies. So if a force is a single interaction between two bodies, we know this is an attractive force between the Earth and the rock. The change in momentum of the rock is caused by that force of gravity during that period of time. But the change in momentum of the Earth is going to be equal to that same force of gravity times that exact same time. So these change in momentum are equal. They're equal and opposite because that same force of gravity is upward on the Earth and downward on the rock. There's another way to look at this. We could also look at this from outside the system. If here is the rock and here is the Earth, we could look at the whole system and say, oh, forces change momentum. But there's no outside forces on this system, so the change in momentum of the system must be zero. And so as the rock gains momentum downward, the Earth is going to gain momentum upward. And then you could say, the momenta are equal. The mass of the rock times the velocity of the rock is equal to the mass of the Earth times the velocity of the Earth only in the negative direction. But we don't see the Earth move. No, we only see the rock fall. Why is that? Right. The mass of the Earth is way, way bigger than the mass of the rock. And so you don't notice that velocity of the Earth moving upward. And the physicist would say, well, the mass of the Earth is infinite, so the velocity is infinitesimal. You don't notice it. So these are your four lenses. It's important that you know how to motivate them. You motivate momentum when you can say forces change momentum, 
Or if there's no force, there's no change in momentum. You motivate energy by identifying an energy transformation from one energy or work and initial energy to a final energy. You motivate the dynamics lens by saying forces are accelerating an object. And your kinematics lens is motivated by looking at motion as an explicit function of time.